Bladder tumors make up about 2% of all the cancers that we see in dogs. However, what that means is that there are tens of thousands of dogs that develop bladder tumors every year. The most common clinical signs involve straining to urinate, blood in the urine, small frequent urinations, or in some cases, patients can be unable to urinate. It's important that we distinguish uh, other types of diseases from bladder tumors. For example, dogs with bladder stones, dogs with polyps in the bladder, and also dogs that have chronic infections can have signs that are very similar to bladder tumors. In order to make the distinction, we often need to start with an ultrasound of the bladder to see if there's a mass in the bladder or the urethra, um, and that helps to confirm the diagnosis. The most common type of cancer that we see in the bladder of dogs is something called a transitional cell carcinoma, which is a cancer of the cells that line the bladder. We can also see these cells in the urethra. There are other types of tumors that you can see in the bladder, but the majority of the tumors are going to be transitional cell carcinoma. We can sometimes see sarcomas in the bladder, we can see lymphoma in the bladder, or we can see other types of carcinoma, but those types of tumors are much rarer. So we're gonna focus our conversation on transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. For the majority of bladder tumors that we see in dogs, they're often advanced cancers and invasive into the muscle layers underneath. The tumor most commonly occurs in a part of the bladder called the trigone of the bladder. And if you think of the bladder as a balloon, the, where you blow the balloon up would be considered to be the urethra and that's where the tumors most commonly occur. What we also see in the trigone is that the little tubes that hook the kidneys up to the bladder, called the ureters, will also run into the bladder at that point where the urethra is running out. This is what makes these tumors particularly difficult to be able to deal with and causes the degree of clinical signs that they do. We don't always know what causes bladder tumors in dogs but there are certain factors that have been associated with either an increased or a decreased risk of bladder tumor development. One of the things that's most important is that we know that there are certain breeds of dogs that have a much higher risk of developing bladder tumors. The most common dog that develops a bladder tumor would be a Scotty, but we can also see these tumors develop more frequently in Shelties, West Highland White Terriers, and also in Beagle Dogs. There has been research that has suggested that exposure to certain lawn chemicals and herbicides can increase the risk of the development of bladder tumors in dogs. Some of the older flea products, such as the flea dips, had also been associated with an increased risk of bladder tumors, but it's important to keep in mind that this is not true of the new flea products that we use. It has also been shown that dogs that eat their vegetables, usually what we would call cruciferous vegetables, have a significantly lower risk of developing bladder cancer, which is important for owners to know when they own one of the breeds of dogs that are a higher risk of developing cancer. It's a one way that we can think of using chemo prevention, that is to use something to prevent the development of cancer rather than to treat it once it's found. In order to make a diagnosis of a bladder tumor, one of the first things that we often start with would be an abdominal ultrasound so we can look at the bladder and the urethra to see if there are any masses or lesions present. Having a mass or a lesion present doesn't automatically mean that it's a tumor, but it does mean that we have to look further into the situation. Male dogs can sometimes have involvement of the prostate because the urethra runs through the prostate and can invade into the prostate and cause enlargement of the prostate, which can be a sign of bladder tumors as well. In order to make a specific diagnosis, one of the tests that is now currently on the market is something that's called a cadet test or known as a BRAF test. The BRAF test involves the collection of urine from the patient, um, we usually need about 40 mLs, and what it does is it's looking for a specific mutation that is found exclusively in transitional cell carcinoma. This test is both very sensitive, it will pick up 95% of the dogs with bladder tumors, and it's also very specific. 
we don't see many dogs with a positive test that don't have a bladder tumor. If the test is negative, and we still suspect that there's a bladder tumor, we may need to look at other diagnostics to confirm the diagnosis. You can look at doing cystoscopy, where you place a scope through the urethra and into the bladder, and then you can get biopsies of any of the affected areas using the cystoscope. In some cases, we can do an open biopsy of the bladder where we would go in and we would take biopsies of the bladder wall. The other means of sometimes getting a diagnosis would be through urine cytology, where we collect the urine and we process it a different method, and up to about 30% of our patients, we can get a definitive diagnosis with urine cytology. We try not to directly aspirate the bladder mass because this is something that can cause seeding of the bladder tumor to other locations in the body. So usually an aspirate of the mass is not recommended and instead we use different diagnostics to make the diagnosis. In dogs, bladder tumors tend to be invasive tumors. They are very locally invasive. In humans, sometimes we can find these tumors when they're superficial, but for most of our dogs, we find them when they've already invaded into the surrounding bladder wall. These tumors also can metastasize or spread to other areas in the body, and the most common sites that they will spread to are the lungs, to the local lymph nodes around where the tumor is, and they can also rarely spread to the bone. Whenever we look at a cancer, we try to look at the features that will allow us to determine how a patient is going to do with treatment. In bladder tumors, we know that there are certain negative factors, factors that mean that a patient would not do as well with treatment. This would include larger tumors, tumors that are already present in other locations like the lymph nodes or to the lungs, younger dogs, or the other would be location of the tumor involving the urethra or the prostate. For whatever reason, these tumors tend to be more aggressive, so they do not respond as well to treatment. When we have a diagnosis of a bladder tumor in dogs, we like to look at different areas of the body to see whether or not the cancer has spread, as well as to look at the overall health of the patient in order to help us assess whether or not they can withstand the treatment protocol that we're recommending. We would always look at doing a set of chest x-rays as these tumors can spread to the lungs, and we know that carries a more guarded prognosis. We will also do a full abdominal ultrasound to look at the lymph nodes surrounding the bladder to see if the tumor may have spread to those locations. It also allows us to look at the health of the kidneys because sometimes we can find bladder tumors can start to obstruct the ureters, which are the tubes that connect the kidneys into the bladder and can cause damage to the kidneys themselves. It's also important that we look at doing a standard blood workup, which would include a CBC, a chemistry profile, and a urinalysis. That specifically allows us to look at things like kidney function, which is important for several of the drugs that we use for bladder tumors, as well as we know that bladder tumors can affect kidney function if they're starting to cause obstruction. There are several different options that we can look at for the treatment of bladder tumors. As with any cancer, we always stress that there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer and that people make decisions differently, and that's based on family factors as well as age of the patient and overall health. You have to remember that there's never a right or a wrong decision. One of the most common things that we look at using for the treatment of bladder tumors would be some type of an aspirin-type drug which are known as NSAIDs. We know that bladder tumors often have markers on the surface that these drugs can bind to so that we can see an anti-cancer effect with a number of these drugs. The most common drugs that we use are paroxicam, duracoxib, and ferrocoxib. These have all been shown in studies to cause partial responses or at least stable disease in our patients. Overall, these drugs are well tolerated but as with any aspirin type drug, we have to watch for gastrointestinal ulceration. So if your dog starts to vomit, has a dark tarry stool or isn't eating, we would recommend stopping the medication immediately and to contact us. And it can also have effects on kidney function. So it's particularly important that dogs have normal kidney function when we're using these drugs. In some cases, 
we will use just an NSAID at the start of therapy and then looking at adding in additional treatment if the tumor progresses in the future. Chemotherapy is commonly used in the treatment of bladder tumors in dogs, and it can be used either as a single agent or along with one of the NSAIDs. The most common drugs that we use for chemotherapy include a drug called vinblastine, carboplatin, and a drug called mitoxantrone. All three of these drugs are given intravenously and are typically well tolerated by most patients. With these types of treatments, we will often go through a six to eight week course of therapy and then go back and repeat an ultrasound to see if there has been a positive effect or at least stable disease. If the disease is stable, then we would continue with that particular drug. There may be no limit to how much chemotherapy we give, providing that the tumor remains stable and that they're not side effects that are associated with the chemotherapy and the patient has a good quality of life. Chemotherapy is well tolerated by most of our patients and the risk of them having a serious side effect is low, only in the neighborhood of about five to 10%. So most of our dogs can go about their normal activities when they're being treated with chemotherapy for bladder tumors. There are several drugs that have been used for the treatment of bladder tumors in dogs that are considered to be targeted therapies. These types of drugs will target specific areas of the cancer, which allows you to spare the rest of the body's cells, so in theory that there are fewer side effects associated with them. However, we do not know everything about the targeted therapies and what the effectiveness will be. So right now, this type of therapy is still in its infancy, but may be something that we would discuss with you at the time of your appointment. Radiation therapy has also been used in the treatment of bladder tumors, although it's relatively uncommon to use. There are several situations where you can look at using radiation therapy. One would be if a patient is obstructed, sometimes you can use a few large doses of radiation therapy to try to help shrink the tumor to relieve the obstruction and to make the patient more comfortable. Radiation therapy has also been used for bladder tumors that have been removed from the bladder but were incompletely removed. This would be a special procedure and your clinician would explain it to you if this were an option for your pet. But in general, given the nature of bladder tumors, we don't use radiation therapy on a regular basis for them. For some of our patients, they may get to the point where they're unable to urinate or their kidneys become obstructed. And there's several things that we can think about doing at that time, depending upon how we feel that their overall quality of life is. One of the things that can be done is you can actually place a stent in the urethra, which is a tube that helps to hold the urethra open so dogs that are obstructed are still able to urinate. We can also place these types of tubes in the ureters. If the tumor is starting to overgrow where the ureters enter the bladder and the kidney function is being affected, we can place a stent in the ureter. We also have the ability to do laser ablation where we take a laser and we're able to go in and to reduce the amount of tumor that's in the urethra to make it easier for a dog to urinate. These are not standard of care procedures, but may provide our patients with extra quality of life when they get to the point where their tumor is no longer responding to conventional therapy. The goal of treatment of bladder tumors is to allow our patients to maintain a good quality of life and be able to do their normal activities. However, at some point, even when a treatment is effective, we will see these tumors continue to progress and they will have signs associated with it. We can see that dogs can have more issues with straining to defecate or straining to urinate. They can sometimes become obstructed. Uh, we sometimes can see changes in kidney function. And in some cases, these tumors can spread to other areas in the body. One place that we can see these tumors spread is to the bone, which then can cause pain or lameness. When these signs start to progress, we need to consider the quality of life and whether or not it's time to make a decision. We typically expect that dogs that don't receive any type of treatment may only have six months before their signs progress to the point where their quality of life is not there. When we treat our patients, what we often find is that we can extend their lifespan to about 12 to 18 months with a good quality of life. This may require the use of several 
different treatments as we go along, but we often find that we can get periods of stability of the cancer through treatment so that our dogs are able to maintain good quality of life for a longer period of time. One of the important things to always remember when we're treating any type of cancer is that there's not a right or a wrong decision when it comes to making treatment decisions. We know that treatment of cancer can always be a scary thing to go through, particularly when it's your pet that has cancer. You have to remember that when you come in to see us, you're now part of a team. That includes yourself, your veterinary oncologist, the veterinary technicians that work with oncologists, and also with the client care team. If you have any questions, we always recommend that you contact us. There's no question that's too small or too silly for us to answer. We're always happy to go back over information for clients because it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to process, and we know that you're making a big decision. Your oncologist may not be in the hospital all the time, but there are people that are there to help you. If you feel that your pet is having an urgent emergency, we recommend either contacting the main number for our hospital, your family veterinarian, as they can often help in these situations, or another local emergency clinic.